Hi, how are you? I'm good. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I think it's, um, I don't, I don't know, um, who else is going to be attending, but I mean, of course, like, I, I think it's, um, completely up to you, like, how much you want to go over the things for the rest of the, um, like, we could go over, I skimmed a lot of stuff, um, because it looked like others didn't, weren't quite up to your level, um, but it depends on like what you want to. I don't want to make you stay for so long either. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's only one other person. Um, so. Hold on, let me look. So what, what exactly are you asking? Oh, I was just, I was just asking like how, uh, it, like which parts you wanted to go, to go over or if you just wanted to go over like the remaining portions. I'll say I have a quick question on the, what we did yesterday. Yeah. Um, one second. Oh uh, yeah. So. I was just, um, you know, playing around a little bit with the uh, OpenCV in Python. Um, mm -hmm. So I just had one small syntax question. I didn't understand um, when you did the threshold thing. I didn't understand why you put the uh, uh, underscore or like the dash kind of, and then the commas and then space thresh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure it's a, like, some sort of Python syntax, but I was wondering why you did that. Yeah, let me back to, um, I did the, well, it returns a tuple, so it returns two values, um, cv2 and um, dot threshold, and I didn't want to save the first value, I didn't want it to assign, I don't want to, I don't want to assign it to anything, so that's why I put underscore, but you can replace that with a variable name if you do want the value to be assigned to a variable name. So I was only using the second value that it returns. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So hold on. Let me look look at what we're um what the computer vision the the notebook has for. Um, we can just continue what we were working on yesterday. Okay. Oh, I know. I had another quick question. Sorry. Yeah. No. Um, go ahead. Um. So I know. I know. Um. So I had a question about like the sizes. Like, I know that has to do with PyTorch, but do you know what those represent and, you know, when you would change the size and how, how that works in PyTorch? The, I'm sorry, the what? The, like, the, you know, like, um, when you run that one command, it says, um, like, the, each, like, neural network or each something has their own, its own size. Well, let me try to find where it is. Um, wait a second. Um, I think you're, I think you can share your screen as well, if that helps. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, so I was looking at this, um, somewhere around here, when you run one of these commands, it says, hold on, let me see. Oh, I think the re re Oh, re yeah. Once it stops, once the background um, stops, uh, the runtime stops running, you have to, I think you can just do, so go ahead and do the, um, I don't, th I don't think you have to do every single cell, okay. um, but I think you, under part four, you can run, um, keep going down, keep going down, um, down, down, it's past all these slides. 
Oh, okay. They, this one? Part four. Run this one? Yeah, I think it's working. Oh, it doesn't look like this saved. Oh, I I think it's okay. And I, uh, it looks like the M MNIST data set is back up, so we can just use that one as well. Oh. It's just um, hand, handwritten digits. Um, is it... Uh, were you asking question, uh, a question about the images shape one no it was oh, okay. to do with the neural network okay yeah um it was i'm trying to find where it is it's maybe it was this one i'm trying to figure out it was i, I know it said it's like you know size something I, and i know it has something to do with like a the neural the neural network because i did a little mm -hmm. bit of tensor flow and you have to set the size mm -hmm. when you're when you're when you're doing this um i don't know if it's layer what part of the neural network it has to do with I'm trying to, I just don't understand. Yeah. Don't understand. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of glossed over that part and I'm, I, I'm actually going to go over it. Um, right. I'll actually go over it right now. Um, okay. when, when, Okay. Can I actually share my screen with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So after um after a two D convolution, um, where you run a filter through the image then you get the resulting image here, and it's still in the 2D form. And when I squeeze the values of this, it becomes a vector, an array. So it's, um, it would, this would become, um, it's five by five array. And when five by five multidimensional matrix will squeeze into 25 by one vector. Um, and, and the 25 by one vector is then put into a network that's similar to this, where each element in the vector is the x1, x2, x3. So the five by five matrix is, is rearranged into a 25 by one so that this function, that these functions can be possible. Because in a, um, the 2D convolution requires it to be in two dimensions, but a linear, a, a linear, um, here. but a linear function requires it to be in a one dimension. And so that's why, um, I, uh, that's why I squeeze it. But I had actually, actually, this is like a, a, a hack to find the um, resulting size. But, um, but like, we, what you would actually do is calculate it out by hand, or like, there's another way to do it. Um, but this was this was a way that um, I set it up as of right now. So that's that's why I um, that's why I squeeze it and find out the size. They usually like almost all um, neural networks that are 
in the class that do classifications. It's um, it it uses a linear function at the very end, and it pairs it with a softmax function. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so then, like, like an example of also like if you wanted to add another layer, um, if, if I wanted to add another layer to the linear, um, so then you can add a, another layer, um, like this. Oh, okay. so that's, that's how you can keep on like modifying the layers and you can do the same by adding um, another layer of this with comments. And that's how you can um, modify the parameters in the network. And this, I think this is, um, I kind of wanted to go over this uh with you because i think it would i think it would really benefit you um if you want to make your own neural network on uh, neural network so um so for so i'm um i'm making a new class this is this is usually the way that i've done it, it kind of um it kind of makes everything modular um, to separate it out as um, classes and objects. And so I have I have the model. I, I have the model that inherits all the attributes of um, part um, PyTorch dot nn um, dot module. So I um, I just inherit everything and just um, and I put, and I initialize the model here, and I just modify the forward, um, the forward function. So that's because because you run the data forward, and then you modify the parameters when you go backward. So then that's why it's forward. Um, and that's already built in as a, as a function in the NN module. Um, and then I create another class, um, and this is just entirely on its own. And this one, um, this one takes in the model and it uh, initiates the initial. It, it tells it basically you initiate the number of uh, iterations that you want to do, um, the validation, the learning rate, um, and basically all the optimization stuff. And so you create a different class, and then you have one functional script that you run out of the model that's, that can be just run like this. So it separates out. It's a much more, I would say it's a much more complex form than probably like what you may find for like a beginner um, format. But um, it, it's, it was what I was comfortable with. So, um, so for, you have the train loader, um, train loader, We've already loaded in from here. And this is, so when you set this to true, you are telling, um, you're setting the download to be true to download the data from the server in which um, the data set comes from the MNIST um, data set server, which is Lacoons. Um, and you, and I also transform it meaning that I transform the data um, into a tensor, uh, which a tensor in a deep learning format is basically you, it's a multi-dimensional um, matrix. If you have like a two by like 
five by five image, then you expand a dimension so it becomes one by five by five. That's all it does. Um, yeah, I think I think that was what I was referring to the tensor size. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So mm. it's if it's um if it's expanded to one by five by five, you can stack them easier, and you um you also you, you also leave the you also expand the dimensions to so that it's uh three dimensions one by five by five so that you leave enough space for um the number of filters and number of channels and then you can stack them so it, um if you have 40 data set, 40 images then it becomes 40 by one by five by five and so 40 representing the number of samples one representing the number of channels or the filters and then five by five is this image size and so that's what it transforms into because that um, allows for the calculation of the um, derivatives to be much um, much easier and faster and then I just normalize the data which is um, just shifting to zero um, just just uh, shifting to zero mean and um, and you know, standard deviation. So it's just to normalize the data. Oh, okay. And and then so you download it, and then you have the data loader. Um, and this one, it's data loaders from PyTorch and it's uh, really all it all it that it does is it loads in 64 images at a time and it's randomly shuffled yeah I mean, yeah I understand that yeah okay, okay. and so you have you you set those here as um you as arguments and you, when you're first um instantiating the object and then you have the learning rate and then you have the number of iterations that you would like to do and then you, and then the model is uh is here you're just importing the model And then you have the optimizer, which is optimizer is um, it's it's what you what you use to um, it's it's what you use to correct or to modify the parameters um say like so the most commonly used one is called atom and that's um that it uses the learning rate but it also makes the learning rate smaller as the training goes so to make it so that you're not overshooting the parameters um, as you're getting closer and closer to the optimal parameters the changes that you are, you will be able you need to make are going to be get smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller as it becomes more accurate so that's where um the parameters for the betas come in like um and so that's um the optimizer is like is a method it's a different type of method that optimizes learning um, and this cross entropy loss is the loss function or the cost function that motivates the network to go in the right direction. And, that, and cross entropy loss is the most commonly used uh, loss function for classification. So like anything that has categories, that's not, that's a discrete and not continuous. Um, say you have different categories of like um, what, um, of like that something that something's a cat and something's a dog 
and those are and this is the function that you want to use. And then there's the train function. Um, so the train, uh, the train fun function right underneath it, it has self model dot train. This is important because it tells, uh, it tells PyTorch that okay, I I want to modify the parameters during the training process, um, and so that's um, you you want to put it in that mode because later for validation um, when you're trying to test how well it does you don't actually want the parameters to be corrected using um, the data set so you set it as dot eval here and so you start your iteration um, here for e in range um, I think I put 10, yeah. So for zero to nine, you run it. Um, and this is the batch, this is the batch size uh, iteration. So since, it, since it's computationally ineffective to, um, to calculate all the, all the images at once, you, um, you want to break it up into little chunks or batches so that you can go and um, so you, you can go ahead and do little bits at a time so that you're not overloading your computer with um, computing uh, your GPU or your CPU and your RAM. And so that's why we break it into small uh, batch sizes. In this case, we, we do 64. Batch size 64. Um, and it's you go ahead and you run the model. And so, since we've already init um, initialized our model here, all we have to do is um, feed in the images, get the output, which is going to be a, um, it's called one hot encoding vector. And so what this is going to come out as since there, since there are um, like 10, there are 10 values. So what the two class, one, one hot encoding, one hot encoding um, means that two classes is going to look like this. Um, okay, two classes, if it's a nine, then it's going to look so it, it creates a vector or it creates a one dimensional array and it um, has a one where the category uh, to represent the category. So this is in the ninth place, if I'm counting right. Um, and so this is this is saying that this is the ninth category. Um, but I think like if you were to run this here, like here, it would say like nine, but it, converts it into a one hot encoding vector. And then what this is going what you get from the loss is the loss is going to look like something like this. Um And, and so on. So it's actually not going to be just purely integers. It's going to be a floating point. And um, that's because we run it through a soft max, which, which takes the scores and it squashes the values to zero and one. So, um, 
and that's to make it kind of like a probability. So, so does it, it do that through like a summation or uh... it um it actually it does it does this so it takes it takes a value and it squashes all the values between zero and one so then like if you have if you have a value that's if you have a value that that's uh like 0 0.1 you can kind of uh understand it as as a 10 percent chance that it's uh class one there's a 20 percent chance that it's a class two and so on and so the the loss here um oops i meant the output sorry um output here is going to you you want to make you want to make sure that it's close to closest to this value as possible um so on the ninth place maybe you wanted it to be 0 0.8 yeah that um, makes sense. yeah and so usually the entire vector it can't be more than um it can't be more than one which i think i did my math wrong so anyways um okay and then now you do the now you calculate the difference between the uh, between your own prediction your estimation and the true uh value and so you have the true classes and you have the output and you calculate the difference and then that becomes your loss value and then you get your optimizer and you just um you just clean it just delete everything that's already on there to um get like a clean slate and then you calculate you kick you calculate the derivatives and you pass the loss back and you see how much uh how much of each parameter that you want to that you would like to um that you would like to shave off and the way that you can do that do you know the chain rule and and okay okay so i have okay so this one's actually kind of like it Okay. So back propagation, all it really is is a chain rule. Um, I have a better diagram. I wasn't going to go over it because it looked it looked like um, well Parker didn't have calculus yet. So, but let me just. So the input of the back propagation is the errors, the errors or the mistakes from the yeah. Training, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
So these, these are actually um, all the lecture slides from lecture six at my school. And it goes into matrix um, derivatives quite a bit, but you don't have to learn that till you're like, actually, I don't think, um, I don't think you learn that in college either. I'm not entirely sure, but. What is that um, calculus for? Hmm? Is that like calculus for? Matrix derivatives? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think multivariate calculus and, um, and differentials are, are calculus for, but I'm not, um, what is it? I'm not entirely sure. But I also um, do recommend this book um, Ian, by Ian Goodfellow, Deep Learning, and Yasha Benjiu. Um, and, okay. So, okay, so if you have So say you have a function x plus y times z, then we can represent it in this diagram, um, like this diagram here, where it's x, y, and you have the operation where it's addition, and you have the operation where it's multiplication. So you plus it first. You're doing a forward propagation, so you're moving in the direction of these arrows. So it's x plus y, and then that gets fed into the multiplication operator that's that gets multiplied by z and you get the output value and so say these are the um numerical values for it um so so say that the loss or the error value is one. So this is this is the loss, and you're taking the the derivative of whatever the loss function, which we're going to assume that it's it's not state it's not shown here what the loss function is, but we know the output. We know the output of the derivative of the loss with respect to the function. Um, and so you get a one. And you carry this one, the loss term one, back. And so it's if you if you take the derivative of um, of this function with respect to z, then you get um, Sorry, I can't. So uh, x z plus y z. So then it's x plus y. So then it's x plus y. So then it becomes five times one. So then the deriv the derivative of this function with respect to z, which is um, which is shown here, is x plus y. And then the derivative of this function, which we saw here is five, I mean, sorry, one. So then five times one is five. So we get this value five. And so that's the, um, that, sorry, the green values are the weights of the parameters. So these are the parameter, val parameter values. Um, so it's, um, so, so when you're back propagating, you are, you're propagating back how much you want to change, um, the parameter value by. So then, so then the, um, so as you pass back the loss, back 
you just keep on switching the um, what you want to take the derivative of. So since it's since directly down the line, it's you want to see what's the um, what's the derivative of this function with the respect of the weight um, that's described here. It's five. So then you take the derivative of that with the respect to w, and uh, in which case w is x plus y, and so you get four, and then you keep going back until you you reach all the parameters that you want to update. So then you want to up, and then so this would mean that um, you want to update this by four, you want to update this by five, you want to update this by four, and so on. And so um, we take the upstream derivative and apply a local gradient to calculate the back propagated derivative. And if that's a lot, that's a lot of jargon, but um, but yeah, it's uh, does that make sense? It's sort of analogous to the chain rule. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. It's, um, I think the one thing that's missing from this particular le uh, lecture slide is that it doesn't really quite describe the weights. Um, and I think this might actually be a better Um, so similar to just the lecture slides that I just showed you, this one um, that it does show you the W's, which are the weights um, of the equation. So it's like W X plus B, and so this one, the forward propagation. Um, goes from x1 to w11 and that's also connected to this one as well which i think actually is um i'm not sure what z z is but i think sigma i'm not entirely sure what this is but it's it's some type of operation. I think sigma is um, sigmoid. So then you do the forward propagation, you get the loss, and you back propagate it back, and you adjust the weights. Um, and so this, this shows you what you're trying to, um, trying to update the parameters, but I think it's pretty messy. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's just calculus. It's not, it's it's not, um, it's not scary. That's all I want to say. <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> it's I think it's um, I think if you just watch like a YouTube tutorial on it and just work it out yourself just once, then you'll you'll understand it. Yeah. Before before we go further, do, do you mind me showing you um, a PyTorsional network I made and then just going it, going it? Yeah, with me? yeah, of course. All right. Just so that you know, I can get more like reinforcement and more understanding. Yeah. So I think it's um, sorry here. So um, I'll just explain it, and then if I get stuck or if I say something wrong, just uh, let me know. <laughs> okay. All right, so, um, well, this isn't actually mine. This is like um, I followed just a, Py a tutorial on Py on like the PyTorch website. Um, oh, okay, That's this great. is like their beginning course. So, um, yeah. Anyways, um, so here we're just loading the loading the data, and then uh -huh. this is the I mean the data loaders you said. Do you know what the this is? Yeah, CFR ten is um a ten class 
um, or 10 categories of natural images. They're color images, so they're RGB channels. And it's like like an airplane, an automobile, and like just, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. That makes sense. And then here we're making the tensor size, right? We're making tensors? Yeah, yeah. All right, and then, okay. so transform is what? It's just a bunch of tensors. It's a matrix or a vector. Transform is the uh, function that you want to run if you want to transform your data into a tensor. Or um, it's just basically little, it, it's just specs that you're putting in um, so that so that you, you can run the transform um, when you're pulling the data set. Okay. All right. And then here we have, this is just showing the image. So this is important, but, um, all right. So I, here's the neural net, neural net class. So we yeah. initialize it here and we, um, we it's like some more initializing and stuff. Okay. So then we do the convolution 2d and mm -hmm. then what are, what are these parameters again? So the, so the first one is the number of channels. And since it's an RGB channel, you uh you it's three channels and uh, and the and six is the number of filters that you want to have so the number of different kernels to where each kernel can detect a certain pattern and five is the width um the width and height because they're usually the same it's, just, it's a square so the size are the width and height are assumed to be the same so um, it's the width and or height of the kernel size. So it's five by five, six five by five kernels. Okay, okay. So if you do more or less kernels, what happens? Um, if you do more kernels, you're able to pick up more, um, you're able to pick up more patterns. The only downside is that when it takes longer to learn and the other um downside is that you might be it's it's a term called overfitting and overfitting is when you make your model so like way too specific so that it can't you can't actually generalize it to like other, other pictures data. yeah mm -hmm. and then um pool uh, not sure what pool does it just yeah. what, does it, what does it do um pool actually takes um takes a region. So if it if you are taking like in this case it's a two by two. Um so you uh well it's a two by two and the stride is two. So then two you take a two by two region and you take the maximum value of that region. And then you skip you go ahead and you skip two voxels and then you go two by two and you take the maximum value. And it's a way of kind of getting rid of, rid of all the unnecessary values and just keeping your model cleaner um, so that you're, you're not left with like so many numbers at the end. That makes sense. Um, all right. And then the convolution is another, um, like another, uh, what is the convolution representing again? Convolution is to detect um, and recognize patterns in the image. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the the it goes between the layers, right? It's like a function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, just making sure. Um, and then these are the linear functions. I'm not sure why there's three because you mentioned that usually they have one at the end. Do you know why there's well, three? Yeah, um, they actually like it, it. So the last linear um function, you see how the um. The last layer function has the value 10 at the end. Um, and that's to signify that you want 10 values in your last vector, one dimensional array. And that's because you have 10 classes. Um, and that's, that's the last step. But if you, if you go there, it has, it has self dot FC one and FC stands for fully connected layer and so you most most people do fully connected layers before like at least one or two fully connected layers um hi Yankai um before the um before the last fully connected layer and that's 
And that's because usually fully connected layers are, you're able to, um, you, you're able to have more parameters. And then, so you have a more complicated model. Okay. More complicated. Okay, and then um, the f and then the forward here. Um, what does that do in this situation? Um, forward is the forward propagation that um, that we went over in the diagram, where it's you follow the arrows forward, and so um, so the forward function is an attribute um that's already kind of like that's that's set in the nn module and you're defining it here um okay so uh, yeah okay and then... yeah so in this case you are doing the convolution and then you kind of nest it and so that's definitely um a way to do it yeah and then okay and then here what was the i'm sure I'm, I'm assuming this is a type of function right but... mm -hmm. it's a rectifier linear unit rel u and it's it's the um it's the function it's on the slides if you go up to Nonlinearity in hidden layers. Yeah, that one. That's the rel u. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So this is the lambda. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. And then, wait. So, um, oh, so this is basically the nonlinear function. Mm -hmm. so, so when would you use a rel u? When would you use a convolution? Um, so ReLU is, so, so rel, ReLU allows you to, um, make your model more efficient. Um, it's not necessarily a, um, like a pattern detector, but it's, it's more of a way to kind of get rid of all the, um, to get rid of all the values that are unnecessary. So. Uh, or that aren't helpful. So all it turns all the um, all the scores that are zero and negative into just the into zeros. And so it's it's a way kind of like how a max pool operation is. It's not necessarily to detect anything, but it's there to um, for efficiency and it's um, and for learning. Um, purposes like you get to um it, it, it's an activation function because at at the end of each operation kind of like a convolution um oh uh, it's actually um it's it's actually kazim's uh file he he wrote a network neural network actually Well, um, so it, it, um, it's not, it's not necessarily to de detect patterns, but it's, um, more, more so for, um, helping your model learn, like, performance-wise. Okay, and, and that's done at the end, right? Or... Right. Um, it's done at the end of each layer. Oh yeah. Okay. All right, and then, uh, 
this is, I think, a little, the end part, but also the more confusing part. Um, so I'm sure that, yeah, so I'm sure this is a, this is like a, a type of a PyTorch um, function, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then, um, I'm not sure what, oh, wait, we did a go over Optim, uh, the optimizer, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure what SGD is. Um, SGD is a different type of optimizer. It's called Stochastic Gradient Descent. And it's... Let me see which one we use once again. We use Atom. Uh, it's, um... Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Atom, like, stochast Stochastic Gradient Descent is the very... It's, it's one of the earliest um, form of optimizers. And Atom is just kind of built on top of that. It um, has more bells and whistles, basically. But stochastic gradient descent basically takes the derivative. Um, it, it takes the derivative of the cost function. So like cost function, um, cost function could be like in a parabolic shape and um, you always want your error to be low. So you want to find the um, lowest point in your function. So in order to find the minimum of a function, you take the derivative and you set it to zero, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so that's what it does. It takes gradient basically means derivative, but in a multidimensional um, like form. Um, and so you take the gradient or the derivative of, of the function and you descend so that you can get to the lowest point. And so that's what it means to cast a gradient descent. Yeah, okay. All right, and then, so that's the optimizer. And then the, this is the running loss mm -hmm. variable. And uh, I'm to see. oh yeah, so we loop through, um, for each epoch, we, we, we loop over the data set multiple times. And mm -hmm. we get the inputs, um, and then zero the parameter gradients, and then we, we're just doing we're optimizing it. So uh, let me see what statistics it prints out. Can, do you mind explaining this part because it's a little bit overwhelming for me? I'm having trouble on comprehending it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, oh, I can't see anymore. Sorry. Okay. Um. So, okay, so the running running loss is just to keep track of what, uh, how your loss is updating. Um, and so it just, in this case, you have running loss plus equals. So you're, you keep adding on per, um, per batch. So, and um, so inputs, um, so, for the data, usually how the data is usually structured is it's a tuple, so tuple, sorry. Um, and you have the uh, you have the data, uh, input data, and you have the class or label, and so that's you're returning those values and you're setting them, um, you're assigning them into inputs and labels um, as variables, and then you zero the parameter gradients um, because uh, because if it's because you want to erase the gradients that you've calculated or the derivatives you've calculated in a previous batch so that you're not accumulating so many um, de derivatives because it will actually mess up your calculation. So you clear out your optimizer um, so that you don't have any gradients. And then, um, and then in the forward, so the net is basically the model that you've defined, which was like, I think like two different layers or something. Yeah, the, that, um, so you are- how do, you, how do you know how many layers it is? Oh, um, just because you have, you have the, um, the convolution. So you have one convolution that's uh that goes through ReLU and pool and i don't and i don't usually consider activation functions and um rel 
uh, like value functions and max pool functions as a layer just because it's not um because it's not a um it's not trying to find the right parameters yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah right. but there's two convolutions here yeah so there's i so there's two layers that i see um in the forward direction so under the forward function um you have x equals self pool f value um and so on so i see oh actually it's four late wait no okay five layers i'm sorry okay so you have f pool uh, self pool two convolution layers convolutional layers and then you squeeze it and then you do um and then you do two two fully connected layers and then you have the last fully connected layer so you, yeah, this one would be five layers total okay uh, all right and then what was i saying i was here yeah yeah okay okay so we take the inputs and yeah so yeah we just run we run the neural neural network mm -hmm. and then we have the loss and we do this criterion thing i think this is oh this is the oh yeah so we're just basically doing collecting the loss from the from pytorch oh. and we are back propagating right uh yeah, yeah, back property and calculating the gradient. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify what FC means to Yankai. Um, oh. FC means fully connected, and um, and that's the that's the linear function. Um, instead of a convolution, it it takes each element in the vector and it calculates its um like relationship to the um to the next layer um input um data set if uh kazim can you actually go to the um go to one of the slides where um it has a linear network um just go down and well actually can you go up sorry um oh down sorry so it's right under yeah keep going down a little bit it's a diagram of convolutional networks yeah that one wait up oh, one more okay so the comp the first the first four layers um the first four layers are convolutions and then the last two layers are the fully connected layers so that's like the difference between um convolutions and fully connected layers is that just how um how many relationships or equations you're turning yes yes it says it's when all the neurons are fully connected with every other neuron in the next layer but in a convolution it's not uh, the neurons are also connected but not to that extent so because you're doing like a you're running a filter through it not necessarily where every neuron is connected with another neuron okay um right, yeah so uh we're right here yeah so we do the the, the backward loss thing and then we back propagate and then what is the what do we do by the step two huh. um uh so off Optimizer step is when you step in the direction of the, so it, well, it's called step, but what it's actually doing is it's modifying the parameters. So all the gradients, the derivatives that you um, calculated, you um, now go ahead and you update the parameters. And um, Yankai also had another question. Um, seems like a neural. Um, what if there are three parameters that are closely related? It seems like neural 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 network only connects two neurons at a time. Um wait, uh where do you 
is it like two two neurons um in the sense of the between two layers or is it because in a fully in a fully connected um in a fully connected network it's the neurons should be connected to all the neurons in the next layer. I'm not, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Okay. Um, Okay, so optimizer step is you you mod you modify you update the parameters to and then you calculate uh, you you calculate or you just update your loss term and then print so then um, do you know the what a mod operator is? That's, oh, you're talking about the, I, this part? Yeah, if I... Yeah, yeah, you're just taking every 2,000. Huh? Yeah, so it's basically like if... No, yeah. It's I, like I, I, the remainder of the division. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, that. That was, okay. Yeah, this part makes sense. Uh, what What does the epoch do again? Epoch is the number of iterations. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then, and this is just the end here. We just say that yeah, something important here. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I think I, I think I'm understanding it a little bit better now. So, okay, if if we don't back propagate, uh huh, will the neural network be somewhat accurate, or like will it just like be really bad? It will just be really bad. It just won't learn anything. Okay, all right. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, so you know how in the loss function you are going down? Oh, um, so it's like 2.168, 1.8, 1.6, and then so on. Um, and then you get to a point where it's 1.285, and then you go up 1.288. So if, if that is what the behavior of your neural network is doing then that usually means um, it's stuck. You can't it can't optimize and have a better accuracy um, because maybe you don't have enough parameters, you don't have enough layers, or you're overshooting or you're overshooting your um, your learning rates too big. And so there are different ways um, that you can you can try to get your um, loss to be lower and that's like a good indicator um the other thing is a loss like a loss value is somewhat arbitrary if i were to look at 2.168 i don't actually know how many images out of like a thousand that's getting right so you don't necessarily have the percentage accuracy so like what you like what i like to do is to keep track of also like um accuracy percentage just because it's more interpretable as yeah. a human. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. That makes sense. I think I'm going to have a little, I think I'm having a little bit of trouble on the math aspect, just the values and the, like the linear, the, I, I, I understand the functions, but um, just like, like the, um, like the parameters and just like the, Technical math. I'm having a little bit of trouble comprehending that, but um, I think I understand uh, the the basic concepts much better now. So thank you. Oh no problem. Um yeah, I mean that was actually the um the last last test task. Uh, I was is actually a um. I'm just gonna share my screen. Was that actually the C4 um, 10 data set? So um, basically you have a different, um, 
a differently written code for it, but it's basically the same thing. So I download, pull the CIFAR, uh, yeah, it's fine. Um, CIFAR 10 data set. Um, and Yankai, I, I, this is on the computer vision notebook. Um, and so you wrap it in um, data loader. And I just set the set the chan channels, so number of channels. So in the comps 2D, like you had um, in Kazim, um, this is where the number three goes. Number of filters, I set it to five. <clears throat> but I think you had, I think you had six, <clears throat> and I do two and so on. So I also have like the normalization layer in there, um, normalizations operator in here as well. And so it's kind of more, um, it's a lot wordier in mine <laughs> than, than yours. Um, and then you have the forward, and this is where I squeeze, and um, and this is so um, the way that you can calculate it, the number of the the way that you can actually calculate the squeeze size is. Um, So the so n is um like look at it as so n in this case in this case it's in a one dimension but I guess this would be in this case where it is a two dimension um so that the output width and output height is determined by um, the width of the input image minus the filter width plus two times padding over the stride number plus one. And so if you use this formula and you just, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, when, when you use this formula, you can actually calculate you can calculate the squeeze size here because you would get the you would get the um you would get the output width and the output height and so it'd be a two by two. I mean sorry, it'd be an n by n um image and you will squeeze that so that it becomes n times n. Does that make sense? <laughs> Did I lose you? <laughs> The equation again yeah yeah sure you stand for uh padding and i actually have an example of that here i glossed over it yesterday um so convolutional padding is when you, zero padding is when you add zeros um, to the outside of the image. And sometimes you do this because you run out of, um, you run out of the images. Um, what I mean by that is say that, say that you want, you, if you were doing, um, if you were doing a stride of two, um, if you're doing a stride of two or stride of three, let's do stride of three, then you'll you'll take the convolution over here where you put the kernel on top here, 
and then you skip three pixels. So it goes one, two, two, three. You skip three pixels and you do another convolution here. And then you skip three pixels and you do another convolution here. But you run out. Um, you run out of, um, it, like, you just don't have any more pixels in this area. So in order to, in order to do another convolution, you can zero pad it, which means you just add two more columns here of zeros, but you want to kind of do it evenly around everywhere, um, just so that it's, it's not biasing. And so that's called zero padding. When you pad the image to be bigger with, with an arbitrary, like non meaningful value, like a zero so that you, um, have enough space to do another convolution. And then you have you have that, <clears throat> and the stride is like basically like how big, how many pixels are you want to skip? Mm -hmm. Um, which, which matrix, Yankai? Is it the, the two equations? Oh, okay. So, um, the matrix would, uh, they, the width and the height of the matrix, um, this, this just calculates the width and the height of the um, output matrix, but yeah, yeah, it's N by N. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so actually, um, Kazim, if you wanna um, go back to your code and look at the, um, look at how they calculated the values or, so you know how they re, um, is it just use equation? Oh, oh no. Um, so the matrix um, doesn't actually get calculated in these two equations, but the, but this is how, this is how the, um, the final matrix is, Formed. So then let's just use this as an example. So basically, um, yeah, let's use this one. So if I were to do a convolution, um, if I were to do a convolution of this across this with the stride of stride of one, which I think is ultimately this. D, um, so it'd be zero two times zero plus one times negative one plus zero times zero plus three times negative one and so on. And so once I do all the multiplications and sum it all up, I'm gonna get a five. And then I'm going to skip one pixel and do one more convolution because this isn't padded, I can't, do another convolution because there's nothing else. So uh, it's going to be one times zero um, plus zero times negative one times zero times zero. And then once you do all this section, you're going to get a num negative nine. And then you're going to snake around and then you're going to do this part. And then you're also going to do another convolution here. So you do, you do four convolution um, and so that you get the matrix. But then, if you want to be, if you want to figure out the dimensions of the of the resulting matrix, then you can just play. This is a four by four input image with a three by three um, kernel, and so you go four minus. Oh, the kernels. Um, they the values in the kernels. Um, 
it's basically it's analogous to like a pattern detector like um for this one's easier to see um so if it's if we kind of um if we kind of see the kernel as uh, well if we see one as white and zero as black then it's an x and so when we take the kernel and we run it across the image we're basically trying to find um, trying to find a location in the image that it overlaps really well with. So then, because if it overlaps perfectly, then you're going to get the highest score, which is five. But then this overlaps um, pretty well, but you have miscellaneous values like here and there. Because since this isn't, um, zeros usually kind of cancel everything out, out so it's not the best um, for pattern detection, but like here, you'll like, you'll, this basically um, reduces the score for anything that's, um, and anything that's like uh, big, like, because negative, if we were to do this convolution here, negative two, negative one, these are fairly small numbers besides negative four. And so um, negative two plus negative one plus zero. So then that's already like negative three and you have neg another negative three. So it becomes a negative six and so on. So the output value is going to be very small. And so uh, it is very small as two, but then, um, but then if you, so this is this pattern this kernel is looking for a pattern where the um, center is much, the center value, so center, center pixel value is much higher than the, um, than say the ones around it. So then in this case, it's 19. So it's saying like, okay, well, three is higher than the values around it. Um, but but this one's all this one's higher and so it's saying um, it's detecting a pattern where two is almost higher than um, two is higher or equal to one two three four five six seven seven of the surrounding neighbors versus this one where it's um, let's see one 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 two three um I guess it's like they're pretty comparable, but like this kernel is looking for like that distinct contrast or like just like a higher value in the center and like lower values all around. So that's what the coefficients mean. So going back to actually going back to this, um, so it'd be look still using this as an example four by four and three by three. So it's four minus three plus, there was no padding, so it's zero over one. And so it's four minus three, um, it's just one, sorry. One over one plus one, which is two. And then it's the same because of the size are the same. So you got a two by two matrix and that's what you see here. Does that make sense? Mm hmm exactly. Yanka, what kind of um, what kind of bioengineering are you interested in? Oh, that's awesome.
Do you have any more questions? Wow, at MGH, the Harvard, um, the Harvard, at, at Harvard in Boston. That's awesome. What did you do there? Like human behavior? Oh, okay. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I have, um, I have a friend who's in the neuroscience um, PhD program, and he does mice work um, too. And he he did he studied the um, dominant and submissive behaviors of mice and how they um, how they act with. Um, Kind of like studying the social hierarchy, um, and he would do surgery on in the on in the mice brain, and he would have electrodes in the uh, mice brain. That's really cool. It was it also mouse behavior? Oh, okay. Okay. That's really cool. That's awesome. Wow, that's so much experience. You guys both um, have so much more experience than I did when I was starting out college. Are, are either of you considering um, grad school, graduate school later on? Or would you want to go straight into industry? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, yeah, I wouldn't say PhD is, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I will say, though, it's harder to get back into school after working because the money is so nice. <laughs> um, and, and then because you have to, like, take the GREs and then you have to, um, ask for letters of recommendation, you have to apply and all this stuff, and that's often a deterrent. But um, I would I would say like the one thing good the one thing about graduate school is that you get to pick and choose what classes um, you want to focus on. So like in in undergrad you have to take all these classes that you may not want to, but they're prerequisites and you don't um, have a lot of choice in that. But in graduate school, you you can really specifically take like certain classes. Oh, wait, are, are you um, are you taking Python or not taking? Have you have even what kind of coding are you looking into? Wait, what year are you in college? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's good. Have you, oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. So, so are you planning on going into industry next year? That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, do you know what you want to do? That's good. Yeah, that's awesome. That's exciting. Well, um, I mean, there are, like, I think, like, people nowadays, I think employers um, ask for people's GitHub or, you know, whatever repo um, to kind of see what kind of projects they were working on. So even if you don't, even if you don't necessarily have, like, an official project, um, yeah, a lot of bioengineering um, companies do do that. Like, I don't have any experience in selling um, drugs either. But what you can do is you can probably start a project, like a Python project um, in GitHub and just make like a, make like a cool, cool tool or like a game or something. And um, I think that will kind of force you to uh, delve deeper into Python as well as have like other employers be able to see what you can do with Python. Um, like another cool thing is to like, to, um, hmm. like one thing that I tried doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, I self taught, uh, I self taught Python as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, neuroscience is so, so awesome. And the cool thing is you get to bridge the gap between, um, because a lot of the computational models are based off of, um, you know, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is the way that our brain works is similar to a way that you compute something mathematically. And so, um, oh, yeah, nice. Oh, uh, from which company? I'm an expert. Are you thinking about um, going into like as like a coder? Um, no, actually, I haven't heard of you before. Oh, wow. I mean, this looks pretty awesome. Entire, I mean, um, this looks really thorough. Wow. How, um, can you do everything in a year? Or is it, it looks like a lot of stuff.
Okay. Is it, is it intensive? Is it, it looks, um, hard. <laughs> That's awesome. Yay. I'm glad. Okay, no problem. Bye. I think I'm going to head out too. And um, I think for tomorrow, I I think I think we've basically covered everything. Um, and I, <laughs> it's okay. Copy and paste is the way to go. Honestly, I always copy and paste everything on over oh, like Stock Exchange or Overstock Overstock. So it's fine. The other thing that was like. <laughs> That's good. Um, the other thing that I wanted, um, that I was going to cover was just GPU stuff, but I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So I'll probably log in for like a little bit tomorrow, but, um, I think today was probably it.